Hello and welcome to the first ever Warwick Artificial Intelligence Summit. This weekend, we'll be looking at, into some of the key areas that AI is currently making its mark on. Through a series of talks, a workshop and a careers panel, you'll be hearing about what I believe to be the most exciting and fast progressing field from the people who are at the forefront of it all. Warwick AI is a relatively new society. So in this introduction, I'd like to take you back to the beginning and explain why and how this summit came about. The world of artificial intelligence is rapidly growing and uniting disciplines as it goes. It's, president in, it's present in our lives, whether we like it or not. A phone has the ability to see, feel touch, sense motion, hear, and do some things we can't, such as emit light or tell you when a friend in Australia likes that you're having coffee. It makes sense to make it think like you do, or better. Human intelligence has led to arguably some of the greatest progression and simultaneous destruction ever seen on this planet. Artificial intelligence is following a similar curve, only much faster and uncapped by biological limits such as evolution and physical form. AI can have eyes all over the world. It can analyze huge amounts of data to learn what took us years in a heartbeat. It's writing poems, maths proofs, and recently some pretty good songs. It can create glorious artwork and allow a robot to walk, backflip, or even drive a car. Just this week, an article was released detailing how analysis of around 800 million tweets predicted that Biden would become the 46th president of the United States. Yet, somehow, it took me until my second year at university as a STEM student to even dip my toe into this incredible world. I personally chose to study maths because of how deep rooted it is to many other disciplines and how, if I play my cards right, no day of work would ever need to be the same. Artificial intelligence takes this idea to a new level. By definition, it's the study of intelligence itself. It has the potential to be applied to any discipline. Intelligence created everything we see around us. The protocols allowing this stream to reach you, the device you're watching it on, and maybe not to the same extent, the words you're hearing now. After learning the seamlessly, seemingly endless possibilities presented by AI, I returned from a summer of intense Googling to share this news with my friends, only to confirm my suspicions that this wonderful technology that's changing our world perhaps not even ultimately for the better, is being hugely underrepresented in the student community and most likely beyond. I later decide to see if anyone shares this opinion. And from an idea just 11 months ago, we've progressed from one to five to 12 incredible exec. One of our core aims is to spread the word of AI and inspire people from a wide range of disciplines by discovering with them how AI is impacting their area of interest. I'd like to thank Tom, Kate, Sanjana, Kurti, Mara, Jess, Ariel, and also Jack for making this possible through the great marketing material that has led to being here today. We've also discussed the incredible potential that a multidisciplinary student community has for creating exciting new ideas and running with them, really running with them. Sanjif, our projects and mentoring co coordinator, is now running projects meetups every Tuesday for this very reason. Make sure to hop on the project's topic on our website to see if anything takes you fancy. We're also running classes for those wanting to learn how to code and implement machine learning algorithms through Project U, which is also on our website. A special mention goes to Abude Roy Chowdhury for developing these ideas and putting in a huge shift to make it a possibility through what we finally settled on to be our website. Knowledge in AI is certainly useful, but knowing how and where to use it is another challenge in itself. Johnny, our careers and welfare officer, has put a huge effort into making sure the link between concept and company grows ever stronger and has single-handedly put together an impressive careers panel for you to ask questions to tomorrow evening. Thanks also to Percy for relentlessly contacting companies and spreading the word of our society to industry. Finally, we saw an opportunity to bring experience from outside of the student community through talks. This is how the idea of the summit came about. And I'd like to thank Marion for the months of hard work she's put into making this entire event possible. We also have two speaker series running throughout the term, which are immortalized on our website, thanks to the huge efforts of Charnin. And also the last exec I'd like to mention, Joe, our vice president, who will be our moderator for this weekend. I know he's excited to start with the first talk, so I'll pass you to over to him now. Thank you very much, Connor, for the introduction. So my name is Joe and I run the speaker series at Warwick AI. Uh, before I introduce the speaker for today, I want to mention a couple of things. And 
the first and most important is the fact that we're running a merch giveaway throughout the whole of this summit. So if you're interested in winning an Amazon Echo hoodies MATLAB merch, then all you have to do is answer ask questions in the chat below. And if we decide to ask your question to our speakers, then you'll be in a chance in with a chance of winning uh, any of the merch. We'll ask the speaker at the end what their favorite question was, which question they thought was most insightful, which one they enjoyed answering the most, and we'll get in touch with that person and send them uh, their merch. The second thing I want to mention is the fact that this summit was not possible without the collaboration of some other societies on the Warwick campus. And for this event in particular, I want to give a special mention to Warwick Biosoc. Um, we actually have Jerry, who's uh, from Warwick Biosoc, who I want to pass you over to, to give you a brief introduction to their society. Hey everyone, um, so I'm Jerry and I'm the Outreach Officer from Warwick Biosoc and I'd really like to thank Warwick AI for this opportunity to collaborate on this talk. It's really been a pleasure working with you as a team. So what is Warwick Biosoc and what do we do? So Warwick Biosoc is an inclusive, diverse community which is cultivated around the shared passion for bioscience. We provide both social activities but also voluntary opportunities. As an Outreach Officer, I run the latter. Currently, we are participating in Movember fundraising for men's health issues, so it would mean a great deal if you could donate using our link, which will be posted, hopefully, with, along with our, all our social media links. And along with everyone else this year, we have been adapting to the current pandemic and transitioning to online events. Our experiences during these hard times has clearly shown us the large role that technology plays in improving our lives. In the continuous pursuit for the better, of the lives of many more, we are undergoing the fourth industrial revolution with AI at its forefront. I'm personally excited to see what the age of automation technologies will bring us. And today's speaker will provide a glimpse into the current cutting edge technology that will build the foundation for the coming future. Thank you very much, Jerry. So without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker. Shirek Shiradaria is the CEO of Caristo Diagnostics, a spin-off from the University of Oxford that is using novel imaging analysis techniques for vascular disease risk prediction. This is undoubtedly an area in which machine intelligence is being used today to have positive real-world impacts. And as such, I'm incredibly excited to pass you over to Shirek so that he can introduce Caristo Diagnostics and explain a little bit more about what he's doing. Thank you, Sherry. I think you're muted there, Sherry. Thank you, Joe. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you all today. Uh, and as Joe said, my name is Chirang Shiradari, and I'm the CEO of Caristo Diagnostics. Uh, and, I, and I'm also a, a consultant cardiologist uh, at the John Rackett Hospital in Oxford. So what I'll attempt to do over the course of the next uh, uh, half an hour to an hour is to give you an overview of where we are in terms of AI in healthcare, and then with a particular focus on the uh, on the technology that Caristo is developing in this field uh, as an illustration of how powerful this can be. So the first place to start is really that uh, AI has been the next big thing for an awfully long time. Um, if you talk to researchers who've been involved in the field, um, they are fairly reticent about where we are with AI, um, but are very excited where it could take us. So if we just take a brief look at the history of AI, the first AI boom actually happened in the 1950s and 60s, really with uh, the birth of computing, Prototype AI was developed, the age of reasoning, and this led to huge hope that this was going to revolutionize our lives. But actually, it made virtually no impact. And so uh, people in the field termed the first AI winter as being in the, in the 70s, where essentially all of that inflated hype, essentially, as I mentioned, led to very little. The second boom occurred in the 80s and 90s. Again, we, we call that the age of knowledge, representation. So uh, this is really where machine learning started to uh, come to the fore. Uh, and again, people thought this was going to have a massive impact on our lives. But again, didn't really lead to meaningful impact. 
But over the last 20 years, we've seen stepwise progression, increase in technology and in uh, wins uh, across multiple areas that make us believe that are we really looking at the at another AI winter to come next? Or is this really going to see the stage where that explosive growth continues to have meaningful effects on our lives? Well, clearly, I believe that the time has arrived for the effective use of AI, and in particular in healthcare. And the reason why I believe that is that we now have a confluence of scientific advances, hardware advances, and software advances that allow us for the first time to boldly go, frankly, where no man has gone before. And this is going to totally change our approach to disease and diagnostics. One of the important things to consider is, uh, is a very eloquent piece of work done by Gordon Moore uh, in the 1950s. And he said in 1965 that the number of components on an integrated circuit would double every year until it would re reach 65,000 by 1975. Now, when he said this in the 1960s, people laughed at that rate of progression in development of, of computer technology. But actually, when it got to 1975, he had proved to be exactly correct. And so Moore's law of so-called doubling of chip transistors every year has now taken a, a wider meaning in terms of technology. Now, the, what's really happened over the last 10 years, and there was a recent report uh, produced by McKinsey and Google AI, what they've shown is that AI computational power is, is increasing far quicker than Moore's law. And that's led to huge improvements in this one illustration that you can see here, which is our analysis of the human genome. Now, clearly, mapping the human genome was probably one of the most important scientific advances over the last 200 years. But it was fearsomely expensive when it was first done uh, at the end of the last millennium. But as you can see, those costs have nosedived. And in particular, they've nosedived in terms of, of mapping a human genome uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years. And that reduction in costs has led to an absolute explosion in our ability to, to interrogate the genome and come up with novel hypotheses and novel ideas and novel insights into disease and its progression. And at the moment, we're at the stage where computing power is doubling not every three or four years, but every three or four months. I, I am sharing at the moment, Joe. Uh, let me um, let me try that again and see. So can you see now, Joe? Perfect. So. <laughs> What you missed was essentially a, a graphic showing the input, uh, go, showing the, the various winters as mentioned of, of, of AI. And we hope that we're going to be now going into a summer of AI. So what I was showing here in, in Moore's Law was showing that there's been a massive explosion in, in and, a, and a reduction in cost of, of mapping something like the human genome, which has allowed us to generate massive new insights into the world of, of DNA, RNA, genomic sequencing, and most importantly, culminating in disease insights. And as mentioned, we're now doubling AI power to analyze things every three or four months rather than three or four years. And that's really allowing us to generate massive advances across the whole of medicine and healthcare that are having already started to have sizable impacts in the way that we manage patients, but the real advances are still to come. So I'll focus first on the role of, of artificial intelligence in, in drug development, which is a, a background that I've been working in for the last 25 years. In the first point, it's important to understand that um, from a, a pharmaceutical and biotech industry development perspective, return on investment 
has been declining steadily over the past 30 to 40 years. This is despite us spending more money than ever on research and development into new drugs. And we've gone from a stage where productivity was now and, and, and return on investment was over 10 percent in the mid 90s for new drugs. But it's now down to less than 2 percent. And as mentioned, this is a big problem because we're spending more money than ever on trying to find new drugs. And if we continue on this steady rate of decline, we will reach a point very soon when it will frankly become economically non-viable to develop new drugs, which is clearly a major problem for us all. To further illustrate the, the problem that we have with new drugs, uh, this is a survey conducted by, by the German healthcare system, and they looked at the impact of new drugs across all therapeutic indications, so from cancer, to cardiovascular disease, to infectious diseases, to neurological diseases. And they looked at the impact of new drugs over the last 10 years. And what they showed was that the majority of new drugs had no added benefit to outcomes and to patient care. So this is something that the drug development industry has known was coming for quite a while and has led them to scratch their heads in a big way as to what they do next because on the one hand they have spiraling research and development costs but on the other they're seeing less and less returns what is the solution here well the solution here is frankly ai and it's being used across the drug development industry to solve this conundrum if we first focus on clinical trials, and many of you will be probably very surprised to know how much it costs to develop a new drug. But to give you an idea, um, for every 1,000 compounds that are discovered, only one out of those 1,000 compounds will actually make it uh, to, to patients. And by patients, I mean getting approved in clinical trials and able to be prescribed by doctors like me to my patients. That's a huge attrition rate that needs to be paid for because obviously for every drug that makes it, you need to pay for the 999 that have failed. And to give you an idea, uh, a, a recently developed drug in the, in, the, in the cardiovascular field where I work, the average cost to develop a new drug is about $2 billion. This is not sustainable economically going forward. And many of those costs are spent on clinical trials. So in other words, generating the data that we need to get a drug approved, showing the drug works. In other words, it's efficacious, but also that it's safe. And AI is being used across the drug development industry in a variety of ways, just to improve the efficiency of clinical trials, to help with patient recruitment and processing of data. We have huge efforts analyzing historical data on clinical trials, to make them more efficient. Uh, one of the companies that I've re recently worked for, uh, we have over 500,000 bits of data coming in every day. And all of those are being analyzed over the last decade to make trials more efficient. We can identify and predict site performance. We can identify the right patients. We can monitor, we can monitor the trials in novel ways, centrally using AI processes. And we're increasingly using remote and wireless devices to capture information on patients to help us identify early trends of safety. In other words, concerns with drugs, but also efficacy in terms of effectiveness of drugs. The ultimate goal where we want to get to is to develop precision medicine tools that allow us to use genetic and molecular data to build biological profiles of patients. And this has really been the holy grail, giving the right drug to the right patients, because many of you will be amazed that many of the drugs that we prescribe to people, the data that we have for them is based on populations, not on individuals. And what we really want to do is to build patient profile, biological profiles that match specific patient subgroups, either to existing therapies, or to develop new therapies that are based on a much clearer understanding of disease mechanisms that underlie the disease. And the possibilities here are enormous. We can develop new drugs, we can price them better. But the important thing to mention with AI is 
it's not simply looking at large amounts of data on their own to derive conclusions. You have to marry back and tie back those findings with the biology because spurious correlations are going to be a big problem for AI where they don't have any biological basis. So you must always tie it back to the basic science. The drug development industry is paying huge attention to AI across the entire spectrum of development, from target discovery to post-approval activities. And the illustration on the left is, is the top 10 pharma companies, and it just shows the important partnerships that they're developing with many companies across this entire industry. And this has led to an explosion in AI healthcare. You can see on the right, this, this snapshot was actually taken about three years ago before Caristo was even formed, showing an absolute explosion in healthcare startups looking to transform AI. And it's going to have huge impacts across many different areas that we work in, from clinical decision support making, to patient diagnosis, to precision medicine, to security. It's gonna affect everything to do with healthcare. Focusing more on the now on the use of AI in clinical care. In other words, how am I managing my patients differently? Or indeed, how am I going to manage my patients differently using AI? And it's going to be across multiple areas. The first area where it's going to be used is in clinical decision making. In other words, replacing human judgment in certain areas. We are all used to having doctors working many, many hours and having an experienced clinician with years of experience versus a fresh clinician making decisions who's less experienced. Can they use AI to make better decisions? Can those decisions that we make at three in the morning be made more accurately with the use of AI? Can we use AI to diagnose patients early and most importantly, predict the outcome of their disease as well as the effect that any treatments that they're taking are going to have on that progression. We're starting to develop ways to get feedback on treatment from patients to allow us to complete the loop. We're also using AI to use non-pharmacological treatments in our patients. Uh, support tools are, are a huge area of importance and patients are able to get dynamic information on their health status uh, from tools that they can buy anywhere. And the Apple Watch is a great example of that. And the other area where AI is having a huge impact and starting to have now is, is on reducing errors. Uh, errors are one of the biggest causes of, of more mortality and morbidity in healthcare. And the use of AI to reduce both diagnostic and therapeutic areas is going to have hugely beneficial effects. So AI, we believe that could improve healthcare outcomes by 30 to 40 percent, but at the same time, cutting treatment costs in half by integrating the huge amounts of information that we have from medical records with operating metrics that allow us to assist physicians in decision making. We can reduce unnecessary hospital visits and we can allow staff to focus on the things that they need to. And one of the big areas where AI is probably having the greatest impact at the moment is actually on administrative duties. So in other words, using technology to reduce the burden of administration on doctors in particular, allowing us to spend more time on treating patients. And I think it was most eloquently put here, um, here that AI will stop doctors being beaten up by their patients because it'll allow us to make better decisions that are better for patient care. But one must also consider that, is this all hype? Is this all going to lead to meaningful changes in the way that we manage patients? And I think this is really something that I cannot overemphasize enough because hype is what will lead to AI's third winter. So, just taking you through the, the, the Gartner hype cycle, which is well known in the world of marketing and technology. When we have a new technology, there's huge hype. It kicks things off. There's early proof of concept stories, media interest, big publicity, but actually no usable products exist at that point. And there is no idea whether anything 
that's being developed has any commercial um, viability. We then lead to the peak of inflated expectations where the publicity produced a couple of early health, early success stories, but there'll also be lots of failures. But some companies are starting to break through and, and, and show meaningful benefits. We then go through the trough of disillusionment. Interest wanes, experiments and implementation actually don't really deliver what everyone expects them to. The producers of the, of the technologies shake off the fat, investors lose interest, um, and people now think that, well, what are we going to do next? And people hone down on the early adopters and thinking, well, how do we how do we harness that early adoption to really take things forward? We then enter the slope of enlightenment where we have some further instances where technologies are making few success stories. We can crystallize those into, into more widely understood success stories. The technology is now entering its second or third iteration and more enterprise wide um, solutions come forward and funding is more targeted and tailored to success. But still people are remaining cautious about the impact it's going to have. And where we ultimately want to get to is this plateau of productivity. So there's mainstream adaptation Technology takes off, it's viable, it's clearly defined, has broad market applicability and reference. The messaging is clear and it's now gone beyond a niche market and we can now continue to grow. So the key question is, where are, where are we at the moment in terms of the AI, particularly in healthcare uh, cycle? Most people would say that we are at the still at the peak of innovation. It's still a lot of hype. We're not seeing it being translated into meaningful effects on our lives. But I would argue that actually we've passed the peak. Um, we're now seeing failures, um, but there are offshoots of success coming through. Um, but we are we still have an awful long way to go and no one should be any under any disillusionment that we or any, any under illusions that this problem is solved yet. And it's going to take people coming through, people like you, who will drive the next generation of development. Where do we want to get to? Well, ultimately, in healthcare, we want to see man and machine working in combination. One of the big fears of the, of the entire healthcare community, and in particular doctors like myself, is that AI will replace doctors. In other words, you won't need us and machines will take over tasks and you'll see mass redundancy. This is not what's going to happen. AI will allow doctors to focus on the tasks that matter, as I mentioned, making diagnoses, making treatment plans, removing administrative tasks. You will still need human oversight to verify that the AI outputs are accurate and to ensure that clinical decisions that are being made are the correct ones. We are not at the point where you can trust AI to make decisions alone. And indeed, regulators do not allow this. We are still at the stage, however, where the use is mainly experimental at the moment. There is incremental process, uh, progress being made. Buy-in is increasing at a very rapid pace, um, but there is still a long way to go. And there are significant challenges that we have ahead. Integration issues are going to be very, very important for us to overcome. Ethical issues, as you'll be aware, there is a huge mistrust of AI amongst the general public. Equally, there is a lot of excitement of, of, about AI uh, amongst the general public. And we're going to need very careful education of uh, to the general public about the ethics of AI. How is your data going to be used? Um, is it safe? Is it going to be used for... Um, for the wrong reasons. All of these things are going to need very careful communication between those of us developing AI technologies, the regulator and the general public. Data privacy as mentioned is an issue that I cannot stress enough that is going to be really shape the future. How willing are people going to be to have their data used in the right way? All of it anonymized and there's huge 
problems with interoperability uh, between AI solutions and electronic health records. Uh, you would, even in a small country like the UK, there are multiple electronic health record systems in use that are largely incompatible, and this needs to be overcome. We need to become much better at sharing data. We need to use that data for continuous training and to further improve and develop our systems. And we need more data diversity. Um, we need data from different age groups, different ethnicities, to allow us to make meaningful conclusions. And the regulator has a huge role to play here. They are having to move at light speed here because we are advancing quicker than they are advancing. And there is huge pressure on the regulator to keep up with this pace of technological advance. And frankly, at the moment, they cannot. One of the big areas that the regulator is struggling with is when they approve a, a system, a software system, they are approving that version of the system. And that approval process can take years. Every time we produce a software update, the regulator classifies that as a new product. And that needs to go through the same laborious approval process. That again, as mentioned, can take a year or two. The problem is that with AI, we're producing updates every four to six weeks. As the data that we're accruing is increasing, as our insights on the data are improving, and as our decision making is improving. And the regulator cannot cope with this pace of change at the moment. So there is a huge debate amongst regulators, both in Europe and the US, as to how do they cope and keep up with the changes and advances that we're making. And at the moment, we don't have a clear answer to this, but there is a lot of attention on this at present. Where do we want to end up? Well, we want to end up in a, in a situation where we're harnessing all of the knowledge that we have from various systems, uh, all digital, and that will be information on patient demographics, the decisions that have been made on their patients and past decisions. We're harmonizing that and processing that using our AI systems to make more informed decisions about diagnosis and treatment. We're recommending those decisions and implementing those decisions in our patient management. And we're getting feedback on the outcomes of those decisions that help to feed in to the next round of decisions that we make on the next set of patients that come through our door. And this is closer than you think. Uh, and I, I expect within the next three to five years, we will be doing that across a variety of diseases. So what I'll focus on now is just a little bit about what Caristo is doing and, and how we're applying this marriage of, of scientific advancement with computational power to make meaningful insights into the way that we manage healthcare and diseases. So Caristo is a spin out from the University of Oxford um, and it's focused initially on treating heart disease. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic and indeed because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which I'll explain in a second, heart disease is the world's biggest killer. It kills one in three people it, we spend over one trillion dollars a year treating it. And indeed, almost all of the long term consequences of COVID-19 in patients are going to be cardiovascular. We need a new approach to how we diagnose patients and treat patients, predicting who are the, going to be the people having heart attacks years before they happen so that we can do something about it. And that's what Caristo is trying to do. We've known for over uh, over 50 years that that um, cardiovascular disease um, is caused by atherosclerosis. And we've also spent the last 50 years identifying patients with narrowings in their coronary arteries. And we have naively thought that heart attacks are more likely to occur if a patient has a severe narrowing in a coronary artery which supplies the heart with blood. But actually, 50% of heart attacks occur in patients who have no narrowings or very minor narrowings, and they are completely missed by all of the current diagnostic tests that we use. 
The reason why they're missed is that the process that leads to heart attacks is called atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease. And we've known that it's an inflammatory disease for over 50 years. The problem is that we've not had an accurate way of detecting inflammation in the coronary arteries. And what we've been searching for is a test that would allow us to identify patients with increased levels of inflammation in their coronary arteries who are missed by current diagnostic tests so that we can start treatments to reduce their risk. And we know that targeting inflammation with drugs is a very effective way to reduce the chances of a patient having a heart attack. And the scientific advances that Caristo's made have been around the study of a layer of fat tissue that surrounds all blood vessels, in particular the coronary arteries, which, which supply the heart with blood. And when you have inflammation in a coronary artery, that causes changes in the texture and composition of the fat tissue that surrounds the coronary arteries. And in short, the fat cells become smaller and the ratio of fat or lipid to water changes as a result of inflammation in the coronary artery. And the most important thing is that these changes in fat texture and composition occur before you have any visible disease in the blood vessel itself. In other words, it's an early warning system identifying at-risk individuals. So when this scientific breakthrough was published, by me and colleagues in Oxford a couple of years ago, there was a huge press fanfare about this. It was front page news in the US and in Europe. But the big question that the scientific community asked was, can this predict who's going to have a heart attack? In other words, can you show that you can identify patients who are going to have a heart attack before their heart attacks have happened? Now, we already had the answer to that question, and we published that the following year, which I'll come on to in a second. But taking you back to how AI has played an important role, I'd mentioned previously that we have to marry together not only large data sets, but also we have to marry that together with solid scientific foundations. And that's what Caristo's done by combining thousands of patients where we have human tissue, it's been fully characterized genotypically, phenotypically and radiomically. And combining that with imaging and high computational power to develop unique signatures of disease, which we call radiotranscriptomic signatures. And that's allowed us to use various radiomic techniques to develop the fat attenuation index, which is an AI developed imaging based biomarker that can predict who's going to have heart attacks or not. And to show you the outcomes, this is a 4,000 patient study that we published in The Lancet. These were 4,000 patients from Europe and the US who had chest pain and underwent a CT heart scan, which is the first line investigation that we use for anyone presenting with chest pain. And these patients were followed for 10 years to see what happened to them. In other words, who developed heart attacks who died from heart attacks and other causes. And what we showed was that if you had an abnormal fat attenuation index or FAI, you had a six to nine fold increased risk of having a fatal heart attack. And you had a five fold increased risk of having a non-fatal heart attack. And this was after adjusting for all conventional risk factors such as age, sex, diabetes, smoking, <laughs> Um, high cholesterol, etc. And to put that risk in context for you, if you're a smoker, your increased risk of dying from a heart attack is about two to three times. And we're talking about a six to nine fold increased risk of having a fatal heart attack. So this is a, a, a paradigm shift in prediction, which is why the technology has been labelled as a game changer by the British Heart Foundation, because it allows us to marry biological insights that we've always known were important, namely the inflammatory nature of atherosclerosis, with a straightforward way of identifying these patients harnessing the power of AI. And to give you an idea, uh, this technology fits seamlessly into the way that we manage patients. And 
We, as mentioned, use CT heart scans as our first line test to identify patients who are at risk of having heart attacks. And we know that of the 80 percent of patients who we currently label as being normal or having non-obstructive disease by conventional analysis today, a quarter of those patients are reclassified as being at high risk uh, of having a heart attack using our technology. And their risk can be managed very effectively using widely available treatments. But in patients who already have obstructive disease by conventional analysis, we know that a quarter of those patients remain at the highest risk of having a heart attack and dying from a heart attack, despite taking conventional treatments. And this is a patient population that the pharmaceutical industry have huge interest in because they are using our technology to identify the highest risk patients to put into their clinical trials because it allows them to run clinical trials that are smaller and last less long and are more cost effective. So in other words, we can bring newer treatments to market quicker. And the people who have to pay for the drugs, like the NHS in the UK, or various insurance and healthcare providers in other countries, are wanting to use our technology to identify the highest risk patients. Healthcare costs are spiraling. We need technology to identify who are the highest risk patients who need the most expensive treatments. Caristo's technology from a patient perspective um, is very straightforward. Um, the patient needs to do nothing different to what they normally do. Uh, all of our analyses are made on a standard CT heart scan. Doesn't matter which CT manufacturer or which CT scan machine anywhere in the world, we can analyze the images. And we can even analyze historical scans. So if patients have had a CT heart scan three or four years ago, we can analyze that scan and redefine their risk. As mentioned, there's huge interest in what Caristo is doing for the drug development industry, and we're being used by uh, a variety of pharmaceutical and biotech companies in clinical trials uh, to make meaningful insights uh, into new drug development. But you also have to show that your new technology will save money to healthcare systems. And we know that simply using our technology in the NHS would save over £250 million to the NHS over a five year period. And that's simply by analyzing CT scans that are already being done. So we're not asking anyone to do anything different apart from send their scans for analysis. Publicity is key in this area. And again, I go back to the, the hype cycle and Caristo is absolutely part of that hype cycle um, from the publicity we've got globally because people are very excited by it. But we have to deliver on that next. And that's exactly what we're we're doing in the next stage of our implementation. But Caristo's technology and insights don't only uh, help us with heart attacks. We have technology that we're developing using AI, which is funded by many external organizations such as the NHS itself, such as the British Heart Foundation, which are allowing us to use these AI insights married with solid scientific foundations to predict stroke risk, to predict aortic aneurysm risk, to predict diabetes risk, and to predict peripheral arterial disease risk. And all of these products Caristo will be bringing to market over the next 12 to 18 months that will allow us to have profound impacts on the way that we manage patients using the power of AI but married with solid science as well. So with that, um, I look forward to answering any questions that you have um, about, about anything that I've spoken about, but thanks very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Jarek, for your, uh, for your presentation. It was fantastic and incredibly insightful. We do have a lot of questions if you're, uh, if you're down to get stuck in. Starting with the spy in the hole, he wants to know if we're using AI to replace clinical trials, and if so, how's that going to work? Um, if you're simulating sort of a biological system in order to train some drug on it or test some drug on it, how can you be sure that your simulation of that biological system is accurate enough that the results are going to represent what happens in real life? Uh, or is that not what you meant when you said uh, you could have clinical trials using AI? It's an excellent question. So ultimately, what you describe is where we'd all love to get to. 
is that realistic? In other words, can you simulate a clinical trial without actually doing it? The answer to that, I think, will always be no. I don't think any regulator will. So, so let me roll this back. The first aim of any regulator is do no harm. And so they will always want to uh, ensure that any new drug is safe and effective. And the human body is complex enough that one can never really demonstrate that until we've actually trialed um, any new medication in humans. Where AI is having a role, however, is making that whole process more efficient. Um, it's allowing us to run smaller clinical trials targeting the right patients who we think are going to respond to the drug. And its aim is to reduce the time period, the white space, what we call it, in, a, in the drug development cycle. But we're never going to replace clinical trials, but we can make them more cost effective and more efficient. I think that's where we want to get to. And that's where we are starting to get to today. Fantastic. And in these, these much smaller, sort of more AI backed clinical trials, if there's a, a drug that comes out of, of of this trial, Ariel wants to know, Ariel wants to know if you'd be personally comfortable taking this drug uh, developed by this AI if um, the AI itself doesn't fully understand what sort of combination of chemicals it's developed for this particular purpose. Uh, would you be comfortable uh, taking that yourself? Yeah, again, it, you know, these are the questions that we're all going to have to grapple with going forward. I think I, I refer back to the last answer that I gave. I think AI has huge roles to play in the early stages of drug development for target, identif for target identification, doing that initial work. But you are never going to take a drug until it's been trialed in humans and has been shown to be effective. So um, I think the idea that you can take a drug that's only ever been developed and, and everything in the entire development has used AI and computer simulation won't happen, but it's it's but absolutely we're already taking drugs today and are marketing drugs that have used AI in their development. But it all has to culminate in still giving that drug to humans. And indeed, many of the COVID nineteen advances that you're seeing happen so rapidly are happening because of AI. But ultimately, you still need a trial to show that it's effective. Uh, if we allow ourselves to sort of speculate momentarily, let's go slightly more long term in the future without wanting to uh, put myself on Gartner's hype cycle too, too high up. If we imagine that we have AI assisted doctors that are um, where the AI is making significant decisions in, in, in the process of um, treating an individual. Marty wants to know whether, since all practitioners have to take the Hippocratic Oath before they practice medicine, and this is a key part of medical ethics, will the AI that's helping making like assisting these uh, decisions will they have to um where does this is a bit of a moral gray area in terms of um an ai is not a morally relevant being since it doesn't have consciousness at this moment in time so it can't take a hippocratic oath therefore they're never going to be able to make decisions on their own or Will the decision that the AI makes have to go via proxy of a human forever and always, and we'll never be able to have fully autonomous AI doctors? Bit of a loaded question there. No, I think I think the question question really gets to the crux of the matter here. So um, I think that a lot of this will depend upon what what the general public and patients are willing to accept as well as what doctors are willing to accept. And I think that's why a huge amount of effort now needs to focus on, on the ethics. My own personal feeling is I, I don't think that we're at the stage yet where anyone would be comfortable um, making a decision purely based on, on AI and not having it sense checked by a human. And indeed, the way that the regulator is approaching this is exactly like that at the moment. So if I use Caristo's technology as an example, we could have developed it with no human involvement at all at any point in the analysis of the, of the CT image. But we actually have a human involvement in two places, at the beginning and the end, for quality control. And it's because the regulator at the moment demands that because they're not comfortable handing over complete decision-making to the AI. 
and they know that again as i mentioned it's it's do no harm first so um they still want the human sign off at the end for liability because as you say um you know having the computer to be liable for everything is not a position where we're we're comfortable yet i think this will evolve over time um i think doctors need to get over the fear that 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 ai will replace them and that's going to take quite a long time because i can tell you that my medical colleagues and i are very resistant to change we want to embrace it but we want to try to control that change um so i think the next 5 to 10 years will answer that question the other very important thing that the one thing that that ai doesn't do well yet is is empathy and an awful lot of medicine is empathy and the act of talking to a patient talking through a problem and i don't think that the general public is yet ready to only interact with a with a computer interface for that um so i i personally think that we are unlikely to get to that level of point quickly i think where where you want to use ai is effective diagnosis better prediction but the final decision from a liability perspective i think we'll have to remain with the human for quite a while still so we're we're talking more of an augmentation than a than a replacement of uh, of correct practice. just uh, something interesting you mentioned there was the uh, two stages in the cristo development process you have a human that interferes sort of in the in the the process and uh, sanity checks your inputs and outputs do you think that is there any chance that that human could be instilling their bias into this system by thinking you know this image this is this is clearly not uh this is clearly a false positive and 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 chucking that 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 image away from the data set and actually missing something important or is this more of a is this definitely a beneficial step um, are, you, are you are you happy with this regulation that you need human intermediaries do you think we could be more powerful without it yeah it's it's a, again a very important point and again it 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 goes back to the philosophy and, and ethics of this so i think you know we're now talking about supervised and unsupervised learning and you know if we really want to get the most out of things it, it should be unsupervised um again i take it back to the point that you know you can get a bunch of statisticians and smart mathematicians and give them large data sets and they'll come out with a whole load of correlations do they actually have any biological meaning most of them don't and that's where i think as i mentioned in my talk taking it back and starting from the basic science is still very important you have to look at the how logical what you're seeing is i think where the human involvement needs to be there and the, and the way that we use it in caristo is it's it's limited to confirming that it's the right part of the of the heart that's being analyzed in other words the blood vessels everything else is then done by the computer and then it's the final report or output from the ai that's then curated into uh, that report that's curated is then checked for um error and it's not really error in the analysis because the analysis is all being done by the ai but the regulator at the moment wants that to be signed off by the ai i think that will change though going forward sure i think you are uh, onto the next question i think you briefly mentioned this but we we were aware of the fact that artificial intelligence the lifeblood of artificial intelligence is data in the same way that the lifeblood of the industrial revolution was was oil james palmer wants to know if there's an issue in regards to treating people with rare illnesses and genetic disabilities for whom we don't have adequate data sets for um are they going to sort of skew the results are their diagnoses going to be less accurate what's the sort of situation with these people it's it's an excellent question and and it's one of the big problems at the moment and so you know um data is a very general term and what you really want is 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 curated data and by that i mean you want data that has outcomes so you know what what happens to the patient and you want it from as diverse a group as possible and that's really the challenge now to build data sets that are diverse and can cope with the the massive range of of humans a, a great example of that is we know that statins which are one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world to treat heart disease and could and they lower they lower blood cholesterol levels they are effective differently in different ethnicities so as a, as a very 
sweeping generalization in some Asian populations, they're less effective and you need to use different doses because of genetic differences in the way that we metabolize drugs. So we really need to have as broad a data set as possible to make our conclusions. Now that presents a huge problem because um, just as oil made a lot of people money, data can make a lot of people money. And people don't want to share data because unfortunately people are not, um, you know, don't have best intentions always. So we need to come up with ways that people can sorry just lost you there for a second you were talking about we need to come up with ways that people can so we we need to come up with the ways that people can collaborate better in terms of sharing data for the betterment of everyone and that's a big hurdle for us to overcome because there is great reluctance to share data and you know the the acts of people like amazon and google have demonstrated that very effectively unfortunately over the last uh, over the last few years sure so my next question is something is to do with regulation. You mentioned that the regulation cannot keep up with the technological development that we're seeing. Um, do you see where do you see this if we follow this to its logical end? Because in my opinion, with the releases of things like uh, GPT-3, which is the text transformer that can write articles and scientific papers and it can write poems, uh, you know, it, it could easily be skewed uh, to generate millions of, of articles to. Um, convince you to vote for one president over the other, for example. Um, you have deep fakes, which are uh, this AI that can map any face onto any video. So you could create some, you know, you can create some pretty um, incriminating videos with this technology. There's a lot of technology arising now, not necessarily the technology that uh, Christo is developing. This is, you can see this is clearly for the benefit of humanity, but do you see the, regulation, the regulators being unable to sort of keep up with where we're going and where do you see that at its logical end does this lead to some logic uh, some blanket ban does this uh what what happens here how do we fix this problem and i know this is a this is a tough question yeah i think i think it's the answer is frankly we don't know um i think you know if you you can separate i think uh, it into two bits so if we talk about healthcare and non-healthcare non-healthcare um data which are kind of, kind of things that you were talking about I think it's going to come down to the appetite of the general public for this. You know, I think, you know, we um, the public is beginning to become a little less trusting of things now, because, as you say, um, things are not black and white anymore. And I think that we will reach um, a crisis point, I think, in, you know, in the next few years as to what people want and don't want. And I think it could go either way, to be totally honest, because, as you say, an awful lot of harm comes out of this. I think healthcare is almost a special case in some ways because it's already a heavily regulated industry, unlike everything else that you talked about. Um, the challenge for the regulator is, as I said, is to keep up with the pace of change. Um, there is no doubt that the regulator will stifle the pace of change. And one could argue that that may not overall be necessarily a bad thing because it will give the public time to um, catch up with all the developments and it will have some form of stamp of authority that if it has been through a, a a regulator and approval process then people should be more trusting of it so from a personal perspective i'm not afraid of the regulation and i think the regulators equally see the benefits but i think having a regulator maintain control is not necessarily a bad thing for everyone Sort of a, a trade-off between the fact that we need to improve our use ai to improve medicine for the benefit of people and to, to improve people's lives now but we also don't want to cut red tape completely to the point where you're introducing dangerous technology into the into the world it is and and, and i think where that's becoming interesting with healthcare is um you know you will all i'm sure own devices that can monitor things about your wellness do they actually mean anything? Are you making decisions that may actually be the wrong decisions for your health based on what you think are the right decisions? 
And I can tell you that that is actually happening. So I think actually having a regulator there is a good thing. But the rise of consumerism is a big risk because many companies see a quick way to market not having to go through regulatory hurdles at all. And that is a problem. Could you give us an example there of, of what you mean by making decisions that are not actually the correct decisions? Well, some of those things, again, as a, as a, as a sweeping example, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two. So, you know, um, the amount of data that you collect from a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, you know, or various, you know, um, tools that are out there to measure various parameters of what you do in your daily life, huge amounts of data, is it actually meaningful? Can you show me any evidence that decisions that people are making based on what they're seeing makes any difference to outcomes? There's zero. I contrast that with the Apple Watch. Uh, so the Apple Watch has now has something in it to do with monitoring your your ECG, which is your, your the trace of your heart. That had to go through regulatory approval. They had to run clinical studies, and they had to show that it was as good as a conventional way of measuring your heart rate and, and your heart rhythm. And so there's confidence in that the output from that is is real. You'd be surprised how many patients you know who I see come in and show me various outputs from devices. So what? I think, you know, you want to see, you know, the world is awash with data. Most of it is meaningless. Um, and it's trying to crystallize down on what are the important data. And the only data that's important is one where you have outcomes and you can show that it's actually going to make a difference. And that's the challenge. There's a, there's a market there. There's a, there's a gap in the market for anybody interested in uh, sort of taking that masses, those masses of data and uh, crystallizing that into something meaningful. So you mentioned at the start that there were 106 AI startups uh, sort of uh, that, that were created around the same or conceived around the same time as Caristo. And I was wondering if you were aware of any of the work that any of them are doing in other sort of revolutionary work, because you mentioned that we're, we're, we're on this, this path to try and build this biological profile. And I think your company fits one of the puzzle pieces. Where are the other puzzle pieces of this biological profile that we're aware of right now? And is there any work being done on them? Or is there quite a lot of gaps in this market for people to get involved in? Yeah, absolutely. So again, that 106 was just a snapshot at one particular time, but th th there are thousands of now doing this. Um, probably if I look at the approach that the UK is taking, which, you know, I, I have to say the UK healthcare system is, is unique in many ways. Um, firstly, it's the largest publicly funded healthcare system in the world. And um, that funding also uh, stretches to research. So the NHS realizes that AI is very important and, and is taking a very um, sensible approach to it um, because it realizes that it has huge cost savings. The other very important about the UK healthcare system is that the decisions that the UK healthcare system makes compared to any other healthcare system in the world are objective. And by that, I mean that they're based on the clinical evidence not on revenue. So again, I'll, I'll sidetrack a little bit, but it, 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 it's a disturbing story that is very relevant though. So, you know, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I'll, I'll give you an example of a conversation and meeting that took place in one of the largest healthcare systems in the US. So an hour long meeting, the first 30 minutes were spent, you know, worrying about how they were going to cope with this influx of patients, um, you know, what services they needed to prioritize um, and how they were going to manage the, the workflow. The second half hour of that meeting was spent discussing revenue. And just and essentially saying, as doctors, you need to order more tests because our revenues are down this quarter and we need to get our revenues up. And so and they essentially said, ignore everything you heard in the first 30 minutes, just order more tests and do more things. Don't care whether it's relevant or not. You need to drive up revenues. That level of thinking, unfortunately, is prevalent in many healthcare systems and uh, and people are naive if they think that doesn't happen. But the UK is quite different because it's a publicly funded healthcare system. The decisions are, bay, are, are very, very objective. So the way that the UK has um, looked at this is the, the NHS actually has a, has a dedicated NHS AI work stream that's funding companies throughout various stages of development, from conception all the way through to 
AI ideas that have already got regulated clearance and are now looking for adoption. So they they announced 150 million pounds to fund this, and the first wave of companies were announced uh, in in I think it was in July August time for funding and various in various streams. So they and they funded 43 different companies across all stages. Of those 43 companies, I think about 35 were UK based companies and and eight were from overseas approximately. But there is a and, and they're across all disciplines of of medicine. So many are focusing on, on, on imaging diagnostics in cancer, in heart disease, in inflammation. Many are focused on therapeutics, developing new drug development platforms. Many are focused on, on, on patient interfaces. Um, but it's and, and what the what the UK wants to do. And, and, and to give you an idea, they, they got over 600 applications. Before they awarded those 40 awards. So the the appetite for this is huge out there. Um, and Caristo was one of the companies that got funded through that for one of our products. But that's the way that we need to do this. We need to. So firstly, in answer to your question, absolutely. For anyone who wants to ha has ideas in this space, there's a huge amount of room for anyone who wants to come in. And in the UK, there are very clear ways to get this funded from the seed idea stage all the way through to the implementation stage. Fantastic. That kind of leads me on to my new question, or, or, or my next question, or perhaps you've, you've you've slightly answered it already, which is, how are students best able to get involved in in this kind of thing? I know for a fact we have a lot of medicine students in the watching. We have a lot of math students, or computer science students, who are itching to sort of move into this space because it's incredibly interesting. Um, perhaps too young at the moment to potentially without the expertise to kind of um, create one of these startups, put it through this system that you were talking about. What's the step now before before that to, to move into this space? What can students be thinking about now while they're studying their degree um, to, to, to move into this exciting sort of un, 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 uncharted territory, should we call it? Mm, it's a great point. So, I mean, um, you know, the, there are companies out there. The companies are all small, looking for keen, enthusiastic people for you know internships. Um, you know, you know if they want to come and work for them at an early stage. I think getting involved in any way you can is good. And certainly from a Carista perspective, you know we'd be delighted to hear from anyone who's interested in 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 getting involved. But I think um, medicine is an interesting one because you, if, if if I take the medical students separate from the others for a second, you know. Um, you need core disciplines and core training in medicine, but you can branch off. You know, when I graduated from medicine, medical school, everyone did the same. That is changing now. When you um, graduate from medical but, school, you uh, we I lost oh, you at that point. When you oh, graduated from medical school, something happened. Tell us more about uh, that. Uh, Apologize. So when I when I graduated from medical school, you know, everyone followed a very defined career path. Sure. It, it, it was very straightforward. And if you deviated off that off that path, you were labeled as a delinquent because people didn't know what to do with you. Um, so, you know, as an example, you know, I mean, I I deviated off and, and decided I wanted to do an MBA when I was, you know, a junior doctor. No one did them at that point. So people didn't have quite have to deal with you. So you have to have the courage of your convictions to do these things um, and, you know, don't be afraid of change. But I think um, in terms of the other disciplines, you know, the, the areas where com what are companies crying out for at the moment? There is an absolute dearth of AI researchers at the moment. So the scientific discipline is is in a massive growth phase, you know, 25 percent of no, probably, sorry. 30% of Caristo's employees are AI researchers, um, and that's only going to increase. Software engineering is a huge area in terms of development at various stages. So there are huge opportunities for people to get involved, no matter what your background is. Fantastic. With that, on that note, uh, I want to bring an end to the, the discussion. Just before we leave, I was wondering if you were able to rack your brains for your favorite question, I can give you a uh, I can give you a reminder of some of them if you'd like. Um, yeah, give me a, 
Give me a quick overview. <laughs> I give you a quick overview. We had the spy in the hole was talking about um, the clinical trials generating the, the clinical trial data. We had James Palmer who was talking about the issues regarding treating people with rare illnesses. Uh, we had Ariel who was talking about would you be comfortable to take a drug that was developed by one of these systems. We had Mardi who was talking about the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, we had... I think those were the ones I asked. Unfortunately, there were a lot that I didn't ask um, because yeah. we ran out of time. So I think I think the important. So I would. Uh, they're all great questions. Firstly, um, and I'm I'm very impressed by the caliber of questions. You've clearly got a great society and a great group. So you know, I I look forward to seeing many of you working for Caristo in due course. Oh, well, I'm sure um, we'll have an influx of uh, applications. I um, um I think the question about the Hippocratic Oath is a very important one um, because I think it's one that as physicians we're going to have to grapple with over the next few years. And we don't have the answers yet. Fantastic. I will uh, get in touch with that person. I want to say thank you so much on the behalf of Warwick AI Society and Warwick Bio Biosoc uh, for coming along and talking to us. Uh, it's been fantastic. And um, best of luck with Caristo and, uh, and everything you do. Thanks, and, uh, I, I, and I hope all goes well with the rest of the conference. Thanks very much for your time. Bye-bye.